Hello, I am Susan Murch, and I study the chemistry of plants and how plant chemistry affects human health. And I'm really interested in how we can develop sustainable, healthy foods for our future. How do you eat what you eat? Well, I want you to take a minute to think about how you make food choices. What do you eat? Do you pick foods that taste good? Do you pick foods that are good for you? Do you pick foods that are good for the planet? This is my husband, Bob. He's eating a slider, and inside of that slider is python meat. Would you eat python? He doesn't really look too sure he wants to eat python. I'm not really too sure I want to eat python either. But I think that if we're going to have a sustainable food future, we all have to think about eating new things. One of the most fascinating things about food is food is all plants. Everything we eat is either a plant, made from a plant, or made from an animal that ate plants, including the python. Except for one thing, salt. So everybody who's on board with eating an entire salt diet, that's good. But the rest of us all have to know something about plants. We get more than 60% of our food from just four plants. Only four, corn, wheat, rice, and potatoes. We use 5% of all the land on Earth to grow just those four plants. That's kind of amazing. And we're really good at growing those four plants. We've been doing it for a long time. So we've been growing these four crops for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years. We've figured out the best varieties, the highest yield. We know how to plant, when to plant, how to manage. We've done breeding programs, and we've learned a lot about these plants. Um, just four plants is not very many, though, and it seems to me that's like keeping all of our eggs in one basket. And so I wanted to think about some of the other plants when I started to think about what could possibly go wrong with just these four. These four are susceptible to the impacts of climate change. In the last five years, we've had a 5.5% decrease in wheat yield, and one-third of the wheat-growing regions have experienced drought. So if we were to lose just one of those crops, it would have a negative impact on all of us. And we can learn lessons from the past about what that impact would be. This is a potato infected with Phytophthora infestans Herb 1. And so that I don't have to keep saying Phytophthora, I'm going to call it Herb 1. So Herb 1 uh, is a pathogen that infects <laughs> potatoes. And it's a bit of a sneaky pathogen because it infects while the potatoes are healthy and growing, and then they rot just before harvest. Herb 1's famous because it's the cause of the Irish potato famine from 1845 to 1852. And during the famine, about one in five people in Ireland either died of starvation and disease or emigrated to a new country. My ancestors came to Canada. So we know that one disease can be devastating to one of our four big crops, and we also know what to do about that. Because we learned about Herb 1, we bred resistant varieties, and planting resistant varieties meant that Herb 1 was no longer as much of a problem for us. It turns out that Herb 1 evolved in Mexico in an area where there's a whole lot of different varieties of potatoes planted together, um, because when there's a lot of different varieties together, that means that there's some that are susceptible and some that are resistant, and Herb 1 could evolve. It, was tra it traveled from Mexico through Europe and then into Ireland and England. And so now when you travel on a plane, we make you fill out a piece of paper that says, do you have any plant material with you? And we strongly encourage you not to carry plant with material with you so that you don't transport disease from one country to another. We work hard on trying to keep our crops safe. We also developed chemical treatments to deal with Phytophthora and other pathogens. So we learned a lot. I think the main thing we learned is about plants. And I think that as we go forward, in order to have food security, we need to know even more about plants. So I want to tell you about my favorite plants. These are plant cells. These cells have been treated with an enzyme, isolated from fungus, in order to dissolve away the cell walls. So they can just float free in solution. If I leave them floating there for a day or two, they'll start to regrow cell walls. They'll assort themselves out into a rigid structure, sort of like prison cells. <coughs> Um, that will hold them in place. We use the cell walls as paper and wood 
Plants make them as a place to store sugars. And plant cells are different than our cells in three other ways. They have a really hard time getting rid of waste, so they produce a lot of chemicals, and then they hold on to those chemicals. An average piece of a leaf has about 35,000 distinct chemicals. They also have green cells inside of them, chloroplasts, that produce food. So they don't have to eat. They produce their own sugars. And finally, the most interesting thing for me is that all plant cells are totipotent, which means they have the total potential to grow into a whole plant. So you can take just one of those cells and make a whole plant. Or you can take a leaf, a one centimeter square piece of a leaf, and make 100,000 plants. We do that in test tubes, where we give them sterile media that has all of the sugars and vitamins that are required for the plants to grow. These are potatoes growing in test tubes. This is how we grow potatoes in the modern era, in order to isolate them from the pathogens that would hurt them. These potatoes then have no viruses, no pathogens, no diseases. And when you get the conditions just right, they grow little miniature tubers like this. Those mini tubers grow by modifying the leaf, which is really fascinating to me, because remember, every plant cell can be anything it chooses to be. Those little potatoes are then taken and grown up to make seed potatoes that are planted out at potato farms. And that's how we have disease-free potatoes. So what if we could feed all of the people on Earth in a way that reduces carbon dioxide and is more sustainable? How would we do that? Well, we need to think beyond the big four crops. We need to think about some of the other things that are available. In 2004, we negotiated an international treaty on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. This treaty covers 65 core crops, of which about 22 are underutilized, or plants that we just don't use enough of and we could improve and make more useful. That's things like strawberries, bananas, asparagus, yams. And the plant that's on your left-hand side which is uh, breadfruit. So I'm going to use breadfruit from my research program as an example of how we bring one of those underutilized crops to modern markets. This is a breadfruit tree. Breadfruit trees grow a fruit that ranges from about a half a kilogram to about three kilograms in size. It tastes like a potato. You use it like a potato. You can eat it baked, boiled, fried. You can make french fries. You can make vodka. You can make beer. Even one of my students is making cosmetics. Breadfruit trees are planted once. If we plant potatoes or wheat, we have to plant them every year and harvest every year. A breadfruit tree will produce fruit for the next 70 to 100 years. And breadfruit trees are sustainable. Each tree sequesters about one to one and a half tons of carbon a year. So they reduce the greenhouse gases. So they produce reliable food. You don't have to keep planting them. They're sustainable. And they produce a food that's a lot like a potato. So why doesn't everyone eat breadfruit? Why is breadfruit an underutilized crop? Well, breadfruit comes from remote places. It's native to... Borneo, it traveled through Papua New Guinea and across the Pacific, and it's mostly found on Pacific Islands. So if you're from the Pacific Islands, it's part of your food culture. If you're not, it's not something you traditionally eat. And one of the most interesting things for me is that what we think is our traditional food is really what our grandmothers cooked. So when I give a talk, I always ask all of the grandmothers in the audience to please cook breadfruit for your grandchildren so that they can have a more sustainable future. It's also true that breadfruit was difficult to propagate and difficult to transport, and it has a little bit of a checkered history. Europeans first started to talk about breadfruit in the 1770s. Sir Joseph Banks was traveling with Captain Cook across the Pacific, and he saw breadfruit trees, and he said, regardless of what else a man does in his life, if he plants 10 breadfruit trees, he's fulfilled his obligation to his own and all future generations. What a lovely sentiment. So when he got back to England, he lobbied King George III 
to have an expedition to go across the Pacific to collect breadfruit trees. That expedition traveled on the famous boat, the Bounty, the HMS Bounty. The sailors went to Tahiti, collected breadfruit, and as you can see, the Bounty was outfitted to carry clay pots to bring the breadfruit trees back from Tahiti to the Caribbean. In what's probably the most f famous botanical disaster in history, there was a mutiny, and the sailors threw all the breadfruit trees into the ocean. So that wasn't good. But Bly was persistent, and he made two more voyages, eventually moving 2,126 trees across the Pacific to the Caribbean, of which about 680 survived. So it was a difficult thing to do. Also, very expensive. This is a breadfruit tree growing in my lab. In 2003, I started trying to figure out how to grow breadfruit trees the same way we grow potatoes. It was difficult and took a long time. By about 2009, we had enough growing in my lab that we were able to share them with other labs and other parts of the world. And to date, there's been about 145,000 breadfruit trees from our original collections planted in 45 countries. So how did we know what kind of breadfruit we should distribute? Well, when you look at this collection, every single tree in this orchard is different. They're all different varieties. They come from different islands. They come from about 34 different Pacific islands. And they have different nutritional composition. Each one tastes different. They have different seasons. They grow differently. So one of the things that my students did was evaluate 94 of these varieties to find the ones with the best possible nutrition. We know the ones that have the most protein, the most vitamins, the most minerals, and are the best for food security. We also know the ones that can grow in saline soil and the ones that can survive a little bit of drought. And it's possible that one of them might even survive a little bit of cold temperature so that we can plant them in even more growing regions. And this is the first one that went to market. There are now four varieties in market and more to come over time. Uh, this particular one is called Mahafala, and Mahafala originates from the island of Western Samoa. This Mahafala is now being grown in Jamaica, and the picture at the top is Mahafala from the trees planted in Jamaica, now available in grocery stores in Canada. So breadfruit is coming to a grocery store near you. And how will you use it? Well, as I said, you use it all the ways you make, use a potato. You can make chips, which is one of my favorites, chips and salsa. You can dry and grind it into a gluten-free, non-GMO, natural flour to be used in bakery goods like chocolate chip cookies. Or you might even make it into a vegan, raw, all-natural, gluten-free, non-GMO wedding cake. <laughs> So in the time I've been speaking, about 260 people died of hunger. I want you to take a deep breath and think about that because it's roughly the size of this audience. So if this audience was experiencing hunger, would you look at food differently? And about 4,500 babies were born, which makes us all a little bit more normal. How are you going to help? Well, it's not just about breadfruit. Breadfruit's my example, but it's really about using underutilized crops. And there are lots of local underutilized crops in every part of the world. So if we used the local crops that are evolved to grow here, we could improve our nutrition, we could improve sustainability, and we could have a better food future for our children and grandchildren. Thank you.